CBS News coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 continues. Here is Walter Cronkite at Kennedy Space Center. Along Cape here uh, into taking into orbit the Apollo 8 spacecraft and uh, the three astronauts who plan to take that spacecraft to the moon and back during this Christmas week. The orbit is almost perfect at 118 by 123 statute miles above the Earth. You heard the report from Mission Control in Houston of 102 and 106 miles. Well, those were nautical miles. Uh, it's 118 by 123 statute miles. The speed is almost perfect, just a little under the 17,500 miles an hour that was uh, desired, but uh, well within uh, the range uh, for Earth orbit. And now these... Uh, uh, this revolution and a half during which uh, the astronauts and ground control will determine if all uh, of the spacecraft uh, machinery is functioning properly and they should be committed to man's first journey to the moon. The next uh, important function then will be the determination of uh, that uh, commitment. Uh, if it uh, is committed, the translunar injection so-called, the uh, beginning of the flight to the moon itself will come at 10.41 uh, Eastern Standard Time. I think I said 9.41 a little earlier. It's not. It's uh, 10.41. That's two hours and 50 minutes uh, after this uh, blast-off. The flight to the moon will take two and a half days, as you uh, undoubtedly know by now. We've mentioned it several times. Uh, this is a $315 million effort getting this Apollo 8 up, and so far it looks like it's worth it. It's, everything has gone perfectly. There are some two and a half to three million parts in that Saturn V, and uh, you can't have uh, even a 1% error because you can see how many parts of that would mean would be malfunctioning. There's got to be virtually no error to get off successfully, and this uh, flight certainly went well. With all of the ground control people and equipment, there were no problems. The, the space men now, uh, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, uh, and Ed Anders are riding there in their 210 cubic feet of the Apollo spacecraft. That's about 70 cubic feet to a man, feet to a person, so you can see about what they have to uh, live in for this uh, next historic week. In the Gemini spacecraft, they just had 40 cubic feet a man, and in the Mercury, just 55. Uh, this uh, spacecraft is, however, uh, a, oh, a transcontinental bus uh, compared to a compact car uh, when you compare the various sizes of spacecraft that have been up so far. They've got hot and cold running water uh, there in the spacecraft. Uh, they've got uh, a vacuum cleaner to uh, keep the uh, dust down and the debris out of the spacecraft. The center couch, uh, the one that Lovell occupies, can be folded up so that they have standing room to perform navigational uh, sightings and uh, get a little exercise. Hammocks are slung under their uh, seats so that they can sleep uh, away from the, uh, the chores that are going on uh, at the consoles themselves. This is a so-called open-end mission that they're flying. That means that there are many commit points uh, along the uh, place. So two of them have, as a matter of fact. First, the launch, and second, uh, the orbital insertion around the Earth. The next commit point is the one of which we have spoken, translunar injection. That is, firing off the third stage engine again uh, with its 230,000 pounds of thrust to boost out of Earth orbit to come almost close to the escape velocity from the Earth's gravitational pull. Not quite. They don't want to do that. If they escape the Earth's gravitational pull entirely, uh, then they would have to depend upon their engines to get home, and if they failed, they could not. Uh, this way, they can go out to the moon and be captured by the moon's gravity uh, in a sort of a slingshot maneuver the moon's gravity would pull them halfway around the moon but would not be strong enough to hold them in orbit so they'd fly off again such as the orbital mechanics and uh, come back being caught by the earth's gravity again to a safe landing if they did nothing more after that translunar injection they plan to do more of course they plan to fire off uh, their service propulsion engine on the far side of the moon uh, when they'll be out of touch of the Earth's communications network on the uh, back side of the moon. They'll make that decision, put themselves into lunar orbit. That's a uh, retrograde maneuver, so-called. They slow down 
so that uh, they do not fly off uh, from the lunar orbit again, but stay in lunar orbit, balancing carefully between the moon's gravity and their own centrifugal force. Uh, then uh, they circularize that orbit, and then that engine does have to fire one more time, and that's the important one. After they have made their 10 orbits of the moon, that engine fires behind uh, the far side of the moon again. And uh, uh, if that firing is successful, uh, the a spacecraft is sent on its way back toward Earth. If the engine does not work on that particular firing, however, uh, the astronauts and their Apollo 8 spacecraft could be caught in lunar orbit forever. And since their life support system aboard the spacecraft could only last uh, five or six more days, that uh, would mean uh, a tragic termination of this flight. Of course, nobody is anticipating that. Uh, but it is one of the hazards that has to be uh, constantly kept in mind. Also, they are flying for the first time. Man is making his first trip uh, through the deep radiation of uh, space out to beyond the so-called Van Allen Belt, uh, which uh, is a belt at the outer fringes of our atmosphere that captures the radiation from the solar system and holds it in a rather a thick uh, belt. Uh, it is not believed radiation nor from solar flares uh, because of the heavy spacecraft covering behind which they are shielded. If, however, they were getting out of the spacecraft, such as making a landing on the moon, then the solar flare activity, these ac periods of intense radioactivity from the sun, uh, could be uh, dangerous to them. However, we have a big tracking network of astronomers around the world keeping tabs on the solar flare activity. It's called the Solar Flare Network, as a matter of fact, and uh, they say that no solar flare activity is expected during the course of this flight. Now let's take a look at the launch, which took place uh, just uh, almost 25 minutes ago here at uh, the Merritt Island Kennedy Space Center. Liftoff at 7.51 Eastern Standard Time. Liftoff at 7.51 Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the top. Start clear. 13 seconds. First the voice of Jack King there, now Paul Haney. Seconds. Right at this point, we were taking a. Want to see the first stage looks good. We were taking a terrific buffeting here in our space center, uh, CBS News space center. Seems almost inconceivable. Six and a half million pounds, the weight of that vehicle. Hundred and thirty million horsepower four, takes to get it off the seconds. ground. All looks great. into the mission, and uh, Frank Borman has confirmed each event as it's been passed to him by Mike Collins at this point. The crew has been given a go for staging. Inboard, out, on time, Frank Borman says. The inboard engines. Two minutes, 25 seconds. We see uh, an S1C, the first stage cut off. S2 has ignited, we can confirm. And the thrust looks good. All engines, all sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. Two minutes, 51 seconds into the mission.
And the uh, three minutes into the flight, we're miles high. Of Apollo 8 was well on its way. That great Saturn V is incidentally 112 times, 112 times as powerful as the Redstone, which uh, lifted Alan Shepard, later Gus Grissom, into their 15-minute suborbital flights back in 1961 and began uh, the U.S. manned space program. We have confirmed from Houston now the official orbital figures, and they are almost precisely what was uh, had been asked of this mission. 99 by 103 nautical miles, or 114 by 118 uh, statute miles. <laughs>